This is unbelievable. The Torah is an intellectual entity. God wants us to strengthen our intellect. We shouldn't be based on emotionalism. Episode number 95. Welcome to the Torah Podcast. Lessons from authentic Judaism. Get the tools and inspiration you need for personal growth. Hosted by Rabbi Mitterhoff. Shalom, this is Rabbi Eliyahu Mitterhoff with this week's Torah Podcast. This week, the Torah portion is Sav. Change your thoughts and change your life. Thoughts that lead to actions. We're going to have a powerful parable about a favor. A great story about Rav Cheskel and peace in your home, caring, and praise. And now, the Torah portion of the week, with novel ideas from the classic commentaries. You might think that in this week's Parsha there's not much to say, because all we're talking about is the details of the karbanos, of the sacrifices. But it's not true, because in every word of the Torah, there's something ethical and moral that we can learn. The verse says like this, Speak to Aaron and his sons and say to him, This is the law of the chattas, in the place where you shall slaughter the ola. Slaughter the chattas before God. It is most holy. So the Shem Mishmu has a question. What is the connection between the ola and the chattas? Two different types of sacrifices. And we see the main one is the ola, and afterwards comes the chattas. The chattas follows after it, because it says, the place where you slaughter the ola, which is in the north, you should also slaughter the chattas. But they're two different types of offerings, so what do they have to do with each other? So he explains. We know that the ola sacrifice was to atone for incorrect thoughts, bad thoughts, and therefore it was brought in the Safon, in the northern part of the Mizbeach, because the north always refers to the intellect. So it's an intellectual sin. On the other hand, the chattas was for a sin that a person did inintentionally. He did it by accident, but he acted. It's more than a thought. So he wants to explain, why does a person have an accidental sin? He wants to say that's because really it's in his consciousness. It's in his subconscious. He wants to do this thing. He wants to make Shabbos. He doesn't want to keep kashris. Who knows what? There's all kinds of things going inside, inside of him. And therefore, he has a slip. Lahav, do we call Freudian slip? He makes a mistake, and that mistake he has to bring a chattas for. So therefore, we see that the original origin of this accidental sin really comes from his thoughts. And that's why he wants to explain that the Torah tells us to put them both in the same place. They're both on the northern side of the Mizbeach because they both come from thoughts. And this is exactly what the Zohar explains. The Zohar says like this, and when a man inclines to sin before his master, he burns in himself the flame of his evil imagination, which comes from the side of the unclean spirit, so the unclean spirit rests on him. So therefore, the fire on the altar and the purpose of this fire is that the priest should prepare it and burn away all these evil thoughts. Therefore, we know that there has to be an ish tamid. The fire has to be constant. So a person should never allow thoughts to come in, evil thoughts, bad thoughts to come into his mind. Because if a person has bad thoughts, he's going to come to act upon them. And the Chas himself explains like this, he says, And Chazal tells us that the Korban Ola atones for evil thoughts. So we may interpret the entire Parsha as being divine assistance, that we can transmit our evil thoughts into good ones. It's in our ability to take our bad thoughts and make them good. And the Parsha begins with someone who's tormented with evil thoughts. So, and when do these thoughts happen? Usually they happen at night. Usually they're suppressed during the day. You don't want to think those thoughts when you're conscious. But as you fall asleep, all of a sudden all these thoughts start to come up. So therefore, we know that the Mizbag burns all night. The Ola burns the entire night. And a person should cast his thoughts on this altar, which burns the entire night. And he explains that the Kohen, who's working with the ashes at the end of the evening, he is dressed in his, all of his garments, which represents the Yetzir Tov. So he says the Yetzir Tov, the good inclination, can uplift our evil thoughts and make them into good thoughts. And we can change ourselves, and we can have good thoughts and do good things instead of having bad thoughts and doing bad things. 
And Rabbeinu Bachi says a similar thing. He says, seeing man entertains his kind of thoughts mostly at night, the offering remained on the altar the entire night to counteract the thoughts that a person has at night, which are not carried out until the daytime. The prophet Micha explained, Oi, those who plan iniquity and design evil on their beds, when morning comes they do them, for they have the power. This is why the Torah commanded that the atonement should occur at the time of the iniquity, since in essence the sin was insubstantive, i.e. it was only in the mind. The offering is to dissolve entirely in the wind, and the smoke rising into the air. The animal nature, so to speak, returned to the regions of the spirit where it came from. No substantial part should be in this world. In other words, it should just stay as a thought, and it burns the entire night as sacrifice for our thoughts, that our thoughts, that our bad thoughts that we have in the evening, they should be ashes by the time it comes to the morning, and therefore we won't come to act upon them. And Rav Shimshan Rafael Hirsch brings the verse that comes at the end of this section of the Torah. It says, this is the law of the Ola offering, the meal offering, the sin offering, and the guilt offering, and the inauguration of the offerings, and the sacrifice of the peace offering, which Hashem commanded Moses on Har Sinai on the day He commanded the children of Israel to bring their offerings to Hashem in the wilderness of Sinai. So if Hirsch wants to explain that the commandment to bring sacrifices, which was during the day, is because we should be lucid. We as Jews, he wants to explain, Moses also related the word of God to the minds of individuals who were aware, awake, with clear mind, with a full awareness, should a person bring near his offering to God, with clear thought, and from free choice, he should dedicate himself to fulfilling the Torah. He says, at nighttime, the thoughts are mingled. When a person lays down at night, he's having all of his subconscious thoughts coming up. But during the day, he has full consciousness. He's aware. The Jewish perception is the antithesis of the heathen perception, he says. Because he explains that the heathens, when do they worship their gods? At night, when they were scared and they were afraid. And God was, they were afraid of God. And during the day, they weren't afraid of God. At night, they were afraid of God. But he says the Jewish perception is the antithesis of the heathen perception. Not in the resignation of the night does the Jew sense God's power. Rather, in the clarity of thought, in the creative action that conquers worlds, in the upright posture of daytime. Precisely, this is when he wants to attain his closest to God. The Jew's perception is that our closest to God comes in reality, when we, in the daytime, in the middle of the day, that's when we come close to God, not in the nighttime. For when God has granted man the share of infinite outpouring of his intellect, a share of this holy free will, a share of his creative power, which dominates this world, thus has God raised man beyond the bonds of the physical world. In the very carrying out of the day's work, a man fulfills the will of God. So we see that the Jewish religion has to do with awareness. In midday, that's when we serve God. The Meshach Hochman says like this also. It's unbelievable. Nevertheless, all Jews, even without reaching the level of prophecy or, pro or philosophers, they truly believe in the Torah's abstract thoughts and the unity of God. And they scoff at these other religions that are based on emotionalism. They understand that the faith based entirely on innate human feelings and thoughts is worthless and translate, representing only man's understanding of really what God is saying. But we as Jews, we really have what God is saying. This is why Chazal said, how did the Jews merit to recite the Shema, which brings the unity of God? Because they were descendants of Avraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov. Because of this knowledge they gained from their forefathers, Jews understand the profound abstract philosophical issue and they scorn emotionally based faith. Judaism is not emotionalism. Many other religions are. So listen to this. How did God ensure that Jews would continue to believe in the abstract unity and prevent Jews from being confused with misled emotions? The answer is that he greatly multiplied intellectual abstract Torah, both in the written law and the oral law. God gave us an intellectual Torah to strengthen our intellect. This was a two-part program. Firstly, to train the intellectual powers and strengthen them so they would overcome the power of fantasy and imagination. Secondly, to deal directly with the misdirection produced by untrained emotions. He gave them mitzvahs which worked against 
harmful feelings and strengthened and sanctified positive feelings. For example, the natural power of love was directed to love of his fellow man, family, and society. And the natural power of vengeance was used against the enemies of the Jewish people. And he appealed to the aesthetic aspect of man by bringing, for example, by beautifying mitzvahs and the holidays. But by losing their significance by the passing of the holiday, so we understand that beauty and emotions are not an end in all. They're just used for the right things. This is unbelievable. The Torah is an intellectual entity. God wants us to strengthen our intellect. We shouldn't be based on emotionalism. And even nowadays, you have sex within Judaism are totally based on emotionalism. They're just using their emotions. And that's what's going on in the world today. God forbid you should say something intellectual. You're considered a racist. But as soon as you talk about feelings, oh, those poor people and these poor people, yeah, yeah, everybody goes, yeah. What are you going to do about those poor people? But Reagan, these people are, are evil. These people are attacking us. Who knows what they're doing to us? Oh, don't say that. That's just an intellectual. Oh, you're a racist. If you're intellectual, you're a racist. If you're emotional, that's considered normal. But this is the antithesis of the Torah. The Torah is telling us to use our intellect, to use our seichel, to have the right thoughts and the proper thoughts, to build our seichel, to build our intelligence. That's the way of the Torah. And Revolbi explains that since there are so many details in each mitzvah, all the Torah learning we have to do to understand even the simplest mitzvah, that is the thing that keeps us in check. That's the thing that kills off our Yetzirah, our fantasies and our emotions that lead us in the wrong way. By having to learn details and be involved with the intellectual pursuit and understanding of what the mitzvah are about and how they work, that beats the Yetzirah. That's the thing that beats your emotional side that wants to drag you to do sins. And the Chavetz Chaim brings the Midrash just like this. When the Pasuk said, Sav es Aaron, and B'nai Yisrael Lemur, say to them, he was tell, the Midrash says to tell the Jews to read the Torah's verse about the Ola burnt offering. In other words, not just actually bring the offering atones for the sin of the thoughts, but the learning about the offering also atones for the thoughts. And he wants to say even further, on a deeper level, however, it's a Torah study that repairs the root of the damage. It's actually the Torah that repairs the root. It's the Torah that brings us to purity your thoughts. And this is what Haman said to Mordechai, since Purim's coming up. Haman said to Mordechai, your fistful of fl a flour outweighs my 10,000 talents of silver. In other words, learning about the fistful of flour that the Kohen has to bring as an offering, that knocks out all the bad decrees. Just the fact that the Jews are learning about their korbanos, it's like they're bringing their korbanos. The learning itself is the korban. That's the sacrifice. It's the learning and thinking in Torah that brings us to new levels. And this is what the Rambam says. He says, a person who is troubled by impure thoughts should focus his mind completely on Torah. For thoughts immorality can only come if a person's mind is empty of Torah thoughts. So we see that the Torah has the same power as the Ola. Just like the Ola would get rid of bad thoughts, the Torah itself gets rid of bad thoughts. When you fill your head up with Torah, you can't have bad thoughts. Your, your head is full. It's only when your head is empty that a person has bad thoughts. And the thoughts lead to sin. And Nisvas Emes brings other alternatives of ways to get rid of bad thoughts. He says the first way is Mesiris Nefesh. When a person dedicates himself and he pushes himself, he pushes himself to grow. He pushes himself to get to the basement just to sit and learn. He pushes himself even when he's tired. That gets rid of bad thoughts. And not only that, but a person's enthusiasm. Get more enthusiasm for your Judaism. The more enthusiasm you have, the less you're going to be bothered by bad thoughts. You don't have time for bad thoughts. You're enthusiastic about doing mitzvahs or doing the right thing. That will also get rid of bad thoughts, according to the Svas Emes. So some of you who are listening may be thinking, wait a second, is Judaism totally intellectual? What about emotions, caring, feeling, love? Where are those emotions? It's a religion. It's not just an intellectual pursuit. It's a religion. So where do emotions come in? So Rav Dester explains, he brings Rav Chaim Vatau, who says like this, Chaim Vatau asked in the Torah, why does the Torah not explicitly prohibit bad mitos, bad character? For example, there should be a negative commandment. Do not get angry. Do not be proud. Why is it written before in the Torah? 
So he wants to answer. The rabbis answer. Derech Eretz Lifnei Torah. It's not really the Torah because you have to have good character in order to, you have to have, what does it mean good character? It means you have to be in control of your emotions. If you're not in control of your emotions, the Torah doesn't even start. If you don't have good character, you can't even learn Torah. Derech Eret Kadma La Torah. Good character comes before the Torah. And Rav Dasser explains the verse said in this week's Parsha. The Kohen shall wear his garment, his midah, of linen. And we know in the Torah, whenever it talks about garments, it's talking about character traits. So he wants to explain. The Vilna Gon explains, he says. The midah, the character traits of a person, should be like a garment, cut to measure. Your character should be cut. It should fit. You have to express your emotions in the proper way and in the proper time. The Vilna Gon further said, being particular about one's robe refers to midah. So we're talking about the Kohen. The Kohen shall wear his garment of linen to precise measurement. This means that he must mold his midos and turn them into holiness. He explains further, Rev. Dessler, midos are not diseases. Emotions are not diseases. Emotion, what do we call midos? We call it deos. The Raman calls midos deos, which means a core belief. But it's an emotional state. Midos are not diseases which need to be eradicated. On the contrary, they are implanted us for a good purpose. It is our task to use them only for good. And this is possible if we make ourselves inward people. If we contact ourselves, we have to show let. We have to conquer our emotions. And we have to use them in the proper way. And he wants to explain. This means as follows. A person who occupies himself with Torah and whose interest lies solely in Torah will find that his mitos and his character and their negative aspect simply do not interest him. Nothing else attracts him. Nothing else is worth desiring. There is nothing that is worth getting angry about. And in the course of time, eventually, if he doesn't exercise his bad mitos, they will atrophy just like a muscle atrophies. In other words, if you get involved in learning and you're excited about learning, therefore your whole desire is learning. You're not involved in all the outward things of the world. And all your desires for the outward things of the world start to atrophy. And not only that, but nothing is worth getting angry about. How can you give over to somebody else your internal state. What am I saying? I'm not going to give somebody else control over me that I'm going to get angry. He's going to make me angry. How can he? My menuchas and nefesh, my peace of mind is the most important thing that I have. I'm not going to give it over to somebody else or something else. I'm going to keep my peace of mind because I understand it's not worth it for me to get angry and upset about something that's happening outside of me. I have control. I am sholet. I'm the one who controls whether I get angry, whether I'm sad, whether I'm depressed. These are my decisions. And this is where emotions come into play when it comes to the Torah, that a person should use his emotions in the media and measurements. He should use them in the proper way. And I just want to end off with Miller from Gates here, who brings a beautiful example of this. First of all, he brings the Pusik that talks about Aaron changing his clothes. What did the verse say? God spoke to Moses, command Aaron and sons, the law of the burnt offering. The priest shall don his linen garments with the linen trousers. And it goes on to speak about the clothes that the priest should wear. So Rashi says there, Aaron had to change it to inferior garments for the performance of the more menial task of cleaning the ashes. He had to change his clothes. What did Rashi say? He's not obliged to change his garments, but it's commendable. Why? Least the garments in which he normally officiates should be soiled, which he removes from the ashes. He brings the chazal, the clothes which he wore while he cooked the pot for his master shouldn't be worn when he serves the wine to his master. You have to change your clothes. It depends on what you're doing. This is exactly the point. So he brings a beautiful example of this. There's a story of, from the tribe of Benjamin. There was a man who was not a good man. His name was Sheba ben Birchi. And he made a revolt against Devon and Melech. So Yoav, he sent out Yoav to go kill him. So when Yoav came to the city, he was going to go and wipe out the city where this man was. So Sarah, the daughter of Asher, she was an old woman, she appeared to him and she said to him, Listen, why? Why should you seek to swallow the inheritance of God? And when Yoav heard this, he became very afraid. She advised him, just get the one guy and throw him over the wall. Don't wipe out the city. But when Yoav heard this, he became very afraid. Why became afraid? First of all, he shouldn't have been afraid. We're talking about an old woman. 
And not only that, we're talking about Yoav, the, the Melech soldier, greatest soldier. He's not afraid of anything. But when he heard these words, why do you seek to swallow the inheritance of God? He became very afraid. So he explains that Chazal tells us that Yoav had both qualities. He was a big year Shemaim, a tremendous fear of God. Enoch and Nami, he was not afraid of anything, and he was the greatest general, and he was absolutely not afraid. But when it came to the fear of God, all of a sudden, all of his emotions changed. When she said to him these words, why do you seek to swallow the inheritance of God? At that point, he really became afraid. Because it's the application of the emotions. In the proper place, you use the emotion of fear. When you're in battle, he didn't use the emotion of fear. But he was sholet. He was able to control his emotions. And this is exactly what the Midrash in Megillah Esther says. It says, And Hamid said in his heart, The wicked are under the control of their hearts. Similarly, Asaph said in his heart. A base person said in his heart. Yeravim said, in his heart. And, some, and, and Haman said, in his heart. But the righteous say the opposite. What do they say? Their heart is within their control, as it says. Hannah was speaking on her heart. And Daniel took to his heart. And David said, to his heart. And they are similar to the Creator, as it said. God said, to his heart. In other words, we have to be divine. We have to be above our emotions, just like a creator said to his heart. Not the opposite, the Rishayim. It's the evil people in the world that their hearts run them. It's all based on emotionalism. It's not based on the seichel. It's not based on right and wrong. It's just based on what they feel. I mean, what they feel is animalistic. Who knows what they're feeling? It's not based on feelings. Judaism means that a person has to show that, and he has to conquer his heart. And that's the proper way that we should go. And this is what we can learn from this week's Parsha, even though it's only talking about Karbanos and the details of the Karbanos. But it's teaching us the right way, which means to pure intellect. We have to work to strengthen our intellect. And we have to use our intellect to decide where and when to apply our emotions. And that's what it means to be a servant of God. That's what it means to do the right thing. We do it based on our intellect. We decide what's right and what's wrong, and we act. And we express our emotions as a servant of God. Here is a powerful parable. Magi Maduba brings the Orachayim that says, prayer took the place of the Korbanos. The sacrifice, we don't have sacrifices today, we don't have a temple. What do we have? We have prayer. And he wants to bring a mush or a parable to explain this. He says, one time there was a person who needed a favor from a friend, and this friend was very close to the king. So he needed him to speak to the government on his behalf. So what did he do? He made a tremendous effort. He traveled many hours to reach the friend's house. And then when he got there, the friend wasn't there. He waited for him a couple more hours. Finally, the friend came and he pleaded with him, please help me, speak to the king for me. So what happened? After he left, the friend spoke to the king. But there was another friend that happened to meet him in the shuk. And as he met him in the shuk, he walks by, he says, hey, how you doing? Listen, can you speak to the king for me? I have a problem. Please, please speak to the king for me. What happened? After this guy left, he didn't speak to the king. What's the difference between the two guys? The answer is, is the first one made an effort. So it stayed on the man's mind and he spoke to the king. But the other one, he just happened to see him. So he forgot. He forgot to speak to the king. What's the nimshal? The nimshal is prayer. If we want our prayer to be a sacrifice, so we have to put effort in. If we put effort in, so then the prayers will be accepted as sacrifices. But if we just do it haphazardly, why would we expect that our prayers will be accepted like a sacrifice? It's time for Great Stories About Great Rabbis. One time, the niece of Rebarak Bar Libowitz was about to leave the country. So what did she do? She went to Rav Yechesko Avramsky's door during World War II and told him she was about to travel from Poland to Russia. Crossing the border was very dangerous. And she wanted a blessing from him. So he said, I'll give you a blessing, but please do me this favor. She said, I have the manuscript of my Sefer, of my book. I want you to bring it to Vilna for me, because he was worried about it. So the woman agreed. But before she left, and she was also worried, she was afraid if they find the Sefer, they're going to kill her. 
So what did she do? She sewed all the pages together into one long sheet, and then she wrapped the sheet around her body. Then she met up with the other 30 people who were about to cross the border. So what happened? As they were crossing, the Russian soldiers saw them, and they started to shoot. So she ran away. And she ran into a silo. There was a bunch of grain in there, and she was hiding inside. But the soldiers saw, and they brought dogs. And they surrounded the silo with these dogs who were trained to pick the scent of a human being. But what happened? The dogs didn't smell anything. She was wrapped in this safer, so it took away her human smell, and the dogs couldn't smell her. What happened? Everybody else that was trying to cross the border got killed, and she survived. So when she got to Vilna, she brought the manuscript to Rav Chaim Ozer, and, he told, and she told the story. Rav Chaim Ozer said, you became part of this Sefer Torah at the time you were wrapped in it. It turns out that she thought she was doing a favor for Rav Cheska of Ramsky, but really Rav Cheska of Ramsky really saved her life. Learn to give, love, and communicate. This is Peace in Your Home. So Rav Moshe Aaron Stone talks about caring for one's family and praise for one's family. He brings a Gemara in Chulim that says, A person should eat and drink with accordance with less that he possesses, and dress in accordance with what he possesses, and honor his wife and children with more than he possesses. So Rav Chaim Shmuel Love says the question, How is it possible to give more cover to your children than what you possess? How is it possible? So he answered, In the way that a man wants to go, Hashem leads him. If he really wants to give honor to his wife and his children, Hashem will help him to get the money, the pranasa that he needs, in order to be able to do that mitzvah. And we know, when it comes to a father and a son, a father will actually help his son more than he's able. And what's the proof? We saw when Moses said to Hashem, Did I conceive this nation? Did I give birth to it? How can I possibly give this entire nation meat to eat? So the Chadushi Arim wants to explain. In other words, he had a kasha. Did I conceive this nation? Mashma, if he did conceive this nation, he would find a way. He would find a way to help the nation to give them all meat to eat. Just like a man, when he conceives a son, he finds a way to help his son. So too, a man should do the same thing for his wife. He should help her more than he has. He should give her the covenant and the honor and the pleasure more than he's able. He tells a story of Rebbe Lopian. One time when he was a bach, he was missing from the yeshiva a couple of days, and the Rosh Yeshiva came to visit him. So he said to him, he says, listen, my apartment is damp, and my kids have been sick for the past couple of days. I had to stay home. So the Rav said, maybe you should find a different apartment. He said, I can't afford a different apartment. So he said to him, you know what you should do? Go find yourself a job, a Torah job, and you'll have more money to be able to switch apartments. And that's how he became a Magad Shir in Yeshiva Kamenetz. So that's in terms of care. What about praise? He says, praise is one of the greatest motivators. The Rambam says, most people will sometimes work with infinite exertion just to receive a little bit of praise. And the Marashal says, the characteristic of people to examine whether people are appreciating them or not. And the Shittim Mikubetzis writes that a person wants that everyone should praise him as one praises a kala. People need praise, and since your wife and your children need praise, you need to praise them. The Kielis Yaakov writes that a wife's chief desire is for her husband's love. And God forbid if you don't give love and praise to your wife, what happens? It's almost like nefesh. God forbid. It's, it's like she has so much pain, she's equal to being a widow, he says. So why doesn't a man give more praise to his wife? The Orchaz Chaim of the Rush explains. It's just selfishness, basically. The tava of man is to ignore good and publicize evil. <laughs> and that's why there's a lacha, that if at the end of the harvest, that if at the end of the season, a man shouldn't stand next to the grain field of another person, because the tava of people, the nature of people, is to give an ayin hara. Naturally, they don't want to give praise. So we have to overcome our natural desires and our natural selfishness to give praise and to give more to our family than even we have. And where do we learn this? We know that when the three angels came to visit Avram Avinu, what did they say? They were pointing out the wonderful qualities of Sarah. This is what the angels were doing. The Gemara Bamatsiya says, in order to fully appreciate her virtues, that Avram, Avram Avinu, should appreciate the virtues of his wife. 
And it's even better than buying her gifts. If a husband gives compliments to his wife, it's even better than buying her a gift. And he read Rav Elia Alopian, when he was also a bachar, he was wondering, how can it be that Rav Simchasis' wife can handle all the stress? She was raising a big family, and she was taking care of all the financial burden that her husband could be the Rosh Hashiva. How is it possible? So he says, one time, he went to the Rosh Hashiva's house for Shabbos, and when he heard how Rav Simchasis spoke to his wife, he understood. For example, he said to her, the challah that you baked was so good, it even tastes like cake. So when he saw his attitude towards his wife, and he saw how he praised her and gave her value, so he understood how she's able to handle all the burdens of raising a large family and supporting him in learning. So if we praise our families and we give them even more than we have, surely we're going to have shalom bias. We will for sure have peace in our home. Okay, that's it for this week's Torah podcast. I hope you enjoyed it, and please share it with your friends and leave comments. Thank you for listening. To get more enthusiasm for your Judaism, become a free member at globalyeshiva.com.